Hello and welcome to part two of the Rapture of the Saints, true or false. This is part of the ongoing Pauline Epistle study. And it's, of course, about the rapture of the church. Is it true or false? We started last week with this and I uh, didn't have time to finish it up. And it broke uh, naturally into two parts. So um, just a second here. We are gone. Hi, I'm Richard. Glad you could join me. I hope you joined us last week because I went through uh, scriptures in the Law and the Prophets. That's the Old Testament about the Lord's return. And I showed that all the scriptures that talked about it uh, are congruent and consistent. And there's one pattern throughout the Old Testament and in the four accounts of our Lord, commonly called the Gospels, uh, and they all agree. Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth. He's going to land on the Mount of Olives, split it into two. A great valley is going to be between it. He's then going to judge the nations, inaugurate his kingdom, and do the resurrection of the just. That's that's it. So tonight we want to go into the Pauline epistles and see what that adds. So I've got a slide presentation here that you can download. It's in the uh, video description as usual. And um, I've also got a book that I finished this week. Uh, started it last week, finished it this week. It's on the rapture of the saints. True or false? It's the textbook for this video presentation. So you can download that. That's also in the video description. And uh, share it with everybody you know. Oh, these books are free. You can download. And I'm doing it so you can easily explain God's word to other people. So when... You explain something to somebody. They ask a question about the Lord's return or something. You really can't give a full answer in five minutes, can you? Or three minutes or whatever you got. You got a little while to explain it. But it's deep. They can't understand Z until they know X and Y. So you got to go back and explain X. And you got to explain Y. By that time, you've run out of time. So that's why I write these books. So you can start a conversation with somebody and tell them where they can get the complete information. Just send them to livefaith.tv or download the books yourself and give them to them. So let's get started on this part two. I'll start with a video presentation. That's not the video presentation. There we go. Or the the uh, PowerPoint presentation, sorry. So there we go. So, Rapture of the Saints, Part 2. Today's focus, we'll look at the rapture, the snatching away in First and Second Thessalonians. First Thessalonians introduces a completely new revelation about our gathering together unto Christ at his return for his body of believers. Second Thessalonians nails the timing of this gathering together unto the Lord event. It is before the day of the Lord. So in this presentation, I have uh, 1 Thessalonians, the pertinent scriptures, uh, in King James Version, where it's not marked as King James. But then I have the concordant version as well. So you can go through both of those, the concordant literal version. And yes, I have all of them here. I'm going to go through a different version of this. Then you'll get to a chart where I've laid out exactly the order of events through the end times, starting with Christ crucified, all the way to when God becomes all in all, the consummation, and the three stages it takes to get there. Christ the first fruits, those who are Christ that is coming, and all the rest of the consummation. Now, I'll go through this chart in a little more detail later on tonight. So tonight, Let's start with this, the rapture of the saints. St. Louis, hi there. Glad you could join us tonight. Um, let me find my book here. Okay, true or false. Let's see. Table of contents will get me there quickest. We want to go to um, this. Last week, we went through the 70 heptads of Daniel's prophecy. If you haven't seen that, you'll want to see it. Uh, look at last week's 
uh, it was Saturday morning, actually, Saturday morning's presentation. There is a, um, a playlist for um, the Pauline Epistle study. It'll, it'll be the, the last one that's on there, not counting this one. So the summary I want to review again from what we learned last week, our Lord's return according to pre-Pauline scriptures. There are many other prophecies of our Lord's coming that I have not included here in, in this document, but they all fit with what has already been presented. Jesus Christ's return, according to the scriptures, written before the Apostle Paul penned 1 Thessalonians, in other words, pre-Pauline, is as follows. One, Jesus returns to the earth to save Israel from her enemies. He lands on the Mount of Olives, and the mountain splits into two halves, leaving a very large valley between them. Number two, the unrighteous are gathered, swept away, and the judgment of the nations occurs, Matthew 25. Three, the temple is cleansed. Jerusalem and earth are restored from all the damage caused by the great tribulation and the wrath of God, and the daily sacrifice is resumed in the cleansed temple. All these activities take 30 days after Christ returns to the earth. Jesus judges the nations, Matthew 25, and sets all right between the living saints. This takes 45 days. This brings us to, this, to 75 days after the Lord returns to the earth on the Mount of Olives. Jesus then raises the just at the first resurrection. This resurrection includes all the righteous Old Testament saints and Gentile proselytes, plus those Jews and Gentiles who are martyred during the Great Tribulation, and there's going to be a multitude of them that refuse to take the mark of the beast and that are going to be beheaded because of it. They're going to get up at this resurrection of the just, 75 days after the Lord returns to the earth on the Mount of Olives. Those that are raised become priests and kings to the nations, for Israel has jurisdiction over the earth. So that's their uh, job description once they get raised from the dead. Jesus, number six, Jesus raises the dead, 1,000, the rest of the dead, 1,000 years later. They appear at the great white throne judgment. This resurrection, number six, is called the uh, resurrection of the unjust. It's a thousand years after this one, the resurrection of the just. So now that we now all the test the scriptures testify this, and if you read the book of Revelation, you'll see this happening just as it is. Now that we've considered the bulk of evidence about the return of Christ up to Paul's writings, let's look at what the Word of God says about the rapture in the Pauline epistles, because that's where it appears. It doesn't appear anywhere else. <clears throat> to do that, let's talk about what is the rapture. Let me get a sip of drink here. I have my trusty power aid, zero sugar. <laughs> Tastes really good too. So what is the rapture? The rapture refers to a single event, a single event when the Lord snatches away from the earth those who believe in him during a specific period of time, which extends from Acts 13 verses 1 and 2, when Paul was severed to go unto the nations to the time of the Lord's return. So from Acts 13, 1 and 2, to up to the time of the Lord's return for the church, that's when this period of time uh, extends that I'm talking about. The word rapture is translated from the Greek word harpazo, which means to seize. Harpazo is, is strong 726 from a derivative of 138, which means to seize in various applications. So harpazo means to catch away, catch up, to pluck, pull up, to take by force. So uh, you can translate it to seize, to catch up, or to snatch away. Um, so it's a verb. It's an action word. Um, usage, I seize, I snatch, I obtain by robbery. It's, it, there's often violence associated with this, this capture word. What helps word study says harpazo is properly seized by force, snatch up suddenly and decisively, like someone seizing bounty, spoil a prize, to take an open display of force, not covertly or secretly, right out in the open. 
That's this. That's the word. Isn't that a great word for the gathering together unto the Lord? Well, let's see what it means in God's word, how God uses it. It's used 14 times in the following verses. It's used first in Matthew 11, 12. It talks about a violent man taking it by force. Uh, Matthew 12, 29, a house and carry off his property. Uh, uh, we can look at these. Let's look at these. I'll go to the word of God here. And we'll go to Matthew Um, so for this, I'm going to use King James. The rest of this book is in uh, concordant version. But so I want to go to Matthew 12, 29. And I'll switch to the KJV here. There we go, 12, 29. Okay, they accused Jesus of being uh, the devil, basically. Uh, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, verse 24, this fellow, Jesus, does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. And that's how he did it. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man? Then he will spoil his house. Um, so he that is not with me is against me. He that is gathered with me scattereth abroad. So that uh, verse in 29 is to carry off his property or to plunder um, in the interlinear. In Matthew, it was to spoil his house, spoil. But it should be to take away, to seize, to seize, right? All right, Matthew 13, nine, uh, 19. Uh, one, and catches them away. Looks at that, Mark, Ma Matthew 13, let's look at that. Once we identify exactly what this word means, we can go see where Paul uses it. 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives sea by the wayside. This is a great uh, parable by Jesus talking about the different types of ground which refer to a person's heart. So uh, the word catch away here is that word harpazo. Catch away to seize, to take by force. The wicked one comes and catches away the word of God sown in his heart. So guard your heart with all diligence, Proverbs says, to prevent that from happening. The next one is going to be John 6.15. We'll go there. John 6.15, chapter 6, verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again into a mountain by himself alone. So uh, take by force is harpazo. Take by force, to seize. Um, the next one is going to be in uh, John 10, 28 and 29. Or John 10, 12 is the first one. John 10, 12, we'll look at that one. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, a hired hand, in other words, whose own sheep they are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches them and scattereth the sheep. So the wolf catches them. He takes them by force and uh, scatters the sheep. Take him by force. Uh, he catches them away. 
Next one, uh, John 10, 28 and 29. So same chapter. My father, which gave them me. Oh, here it is. <clears throat> 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them Eonian life, it should read, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And pluck out, pluck out is harpazo. Verse 29, my father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Pluck out, again, twice used um, for the translation of harpazo. Or harpazo, I'm not sure how you say that. Let's look at, there's only a few, three more. Acts 8.39. Go to Acts chapter 8, verse 39. And here we got, when they were come, oh, all right, this is when Philip witnessed to the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch says, uh, here's water, what hinders it me to be baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, caught away Philip, that eunuch, and saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. So the Lord caught away Philip. He took him by force. He seized Philip and put him in Astos. Azotus, sorry. Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities until he came to Caesarea. So he's in Samaria, but the Lord catches him away to Azotus. Pretty cool, huh? That's catch away. One of the translations says translated. <laughs> Interesting word, but it's ca caught away, harpizo, or harpazo, sorry. Huh? Now, uh, two more. Acts 23.10. Look at that one. Acts 23, verse 10. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. To take him by force. Take by force is Harpazo. This is when Paul was uh, in Ephesus. And uh, the people there tried to pull him apart. He was saved by the Romans coming in there. So we have one more usage of this. Uh, Second Corinthians 12, 2. And this is a very telling one here. We're going to see. Second Corinthians. Get over to that. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, more than 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Harpazo, caught up to the third heaven, taken by force to the third heaven, seized and taken to the third heaven. That's the word harpazo here. So it's used of Philip being seized and taken and put somewhere else. Uh, it's used of Paul is the man it's talking about here who got a vision of the new earth and the third heaven. And uh, he was seized and taken there. So those are the usages of harpazo. You can see exactly what it means. Now, when we get to, um, I'm sorry, there's a few more here. There's four more. 2 Corinthians 12, 4, might as well look at it. 2 Corinthians 12, 4, how that he was, oh, uh, such a one caught up in verse 2, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows, he that, how that he was caught up into paradise, caught, a, caught away, uh, seized and taken to paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Uh, I would teach on this, but that's not the subject tonight, on what happened there. 
basically, well, I'll tell you, Paul was given a vision of, he was stoned to death in Lystra. And um, God gave him a vision of the new heaven and earth coming, the third heaven and the and paradise, which is the new earth. So he, he took him by force to show it to him. And that gave Paul great endurance to continue fighting the fight, the good fight of faith. So we got that. We've got first, uh, I'll skip this because this is our main verse, First Thessalonians 4.17. I can look at Jude one twenty three, uh, talking about sinners. If you see somebody in, in, in that situation, pull them out of the fire, snatch them, <laughs> snatching them, pulling out of the fire, take them by force if necessary. And uh, Revelation twelve five. We'll look at this one in the scriptures. Very important one here concerns our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12, verse 5, sorry, chapter 12, Revelation. Tw chapter 12 of Revelation, and I'm going to be doing a uh, series, a course on the book of Revelation here. I sent out a poll to my subscribers, and uh, over 50% want Revelation. 21% wanted more on the Pauline epistles. 21% wanted more on Acts. 50% wanted revelation and then the rest was other things so i will do a um a, a course i'll start putting that together uh this weekend and it's going to take me a couple weeks to do that now because you know how in depth i go with with uh courses i don't just say a verse here and talk for 30 minutes i actually get into the scripture and show all the aspects so it'll give me a couple weeks to put that together and i'll have a course on revelation for you and it will be the most accurate course you've ever seen. I've been through quite a few of them, believe me. Okay, this is 12, by the way, is a uh, time capsule, I call it. It's a time capsule. It goes back in time and it goes ahead in time. And it gives a reason for why everything's happening in this book of Revelation. It justifies what's happening. That's what Revelation chapter 12 is. So, verse 1, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. This is an uh, astronomical um, configuration. Uh, it's constellations coming into proximity with each other. The woman symbolizes Israel, and she's clothed with the sun. The moon symbolizes Christ, reflecting the Father's light under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Those are the 12 signs of the zodiac. And she being filled with child, cried, travailing in birth, Israel having a child, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. I'll explain that in the course on Revelation, but not here. His, the dragon's tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Guess who that is? Jesus Christ, the man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's what Israel's child is. And her child, Jesus, was caught up unto God into his throne. The word caught up is harpazo. He's caught up unto God into his throne. So it's a seizing, a taking away. So um, he's crucified and then caught up unto God to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness. That's what Jesus told them to do. So uh, that's a significant usage of harpazo that lets us know exactly what it means. Talk about taking by force somebody from one place to another. So the, the word harpazo means to snatch away or to take by force. It indicates a sudden, immediate even violent action. It's used of the Apostle Paul being snatched away to the third heaven, and it's used of Philip being translated or caught away from Samaria to another location. Uh, 
Azotus. Philip was literally taken from one place on earth and was placed at another place on earth. The location is not specified in the word harpazo, just the act of snatching away is. Jesus was snatched away to above the heavens when he ascended. When the Greek of 1 Thessalonians was translated into Latin, the Latin word raptus was used for harpazo. Rapture is a transliteration of raptus, and it also means to snatch away. Either word can be used accurately to describe the same event, which we shall now examine. So I've heard people, and just last night I listened to a 20-minute presentation on why rapture is wrong, but snatching together away is. But the teacher had no clue that Harp that uh, this word raptus means to snatch away in Latin. It comes from the Latin Vulgate. So when they, they, they made the Latin Vulgate, rapture did not have the connotation it does today to mean um, uh, if, if, if you're raptured, rapturous, you're uh, elated. It didn't have the, the meaning of elated when uh, the uh, Latin Vulgate was translated. It just had the meaning snatch away. So the words are, uh, comp are identical. One's in Greek, one's in Latin. Harpazo, to seize, to snatch away. And uh, raptus, raptus in Latin, which is to seize or take away. Either word can be used to accurately describe the same event. And we're going to examine that. So the rapture is referenced in the following scriptures. I'm going to switch over to the document, which you can download in the video description. First Thessalonians 4, verses 12 through 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you don't sorrow, not as even others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, you believe that Jesus died and rose again? Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, the way this is translated, it sounds like they're up there with him. That's not, that's not the case. Uh, in case you doubt, 1 Timothy 5 tells us that the only person with immortal life at this point in time is Jesus Christ. That's it. He's the only one with immortal life at this time. What about the, all the rest who have died? Well, they're in the grave waiting for one of the resurrections coming up, either one of the two that uh, are talked about in the Old Testament that we covered, the, the resurrection of the just and the unjust, or this gathering together, this, this snatching away that we're reading about now. So if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep, and the word sleep is used over 500 times in God's word to denote death, because from man's point of view, we're dead. But from God's, when we die, but from God's point of view, he's going to raise the dead. He's going to wake them up from the dead. And that's why he uses the figure of speech, sleep. So even though which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? We'll look at another translation in a moment. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Very important phrase here. I'm going to make it bold. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent, and this is, this Greek word means uh, proceed, uh, precede. Shall not precede them which are asleep. So uh, we which are alive and remain, and the Lord's coming back at a certain moment in time. Those who are alive and remain at that moment will not precede those which have already died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, that's chief messenger, by the way, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive shall be, and remain shall be caught up, harpazo, Latin raptus, snatched away. We will be caught up or snatched away together with them in the clouds. So the dead and the living are going to be together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is the genuine comfort, is that when Christ returns, the dead who have died in Christ are going to be raised 
a split second before those who are alive are caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. So this snatching away is the event we're talking about here. And this is what we're supposed to comfort one another with. When uh, a preacher tells a person, well, your Aunt Betty is in heaven with Jesus now, it may bring comfort to the person knowing that their uh, relatives are with Jesus, but it's a complete lie. What's the truth? The truth is Aunt Betty is in the grave awaiting for either the rapture, if she believed, or the resurrection of the unjust or just, if she was in a different period of time, or if she didn't believe. So uh, it's not comfort, genuine comfort, to comfort with a lie. If people believe the lie, they'll be comforted anyway. But we want to teach the truth in love, truthing it in love. The truth is the dead are dead until Christ raises the dead. If Christ didn't raise the dead, they would stay dead. And, and that's pretty much the exact wording in 1 Corinthians 15 when Paul is arguing uh, for the resurrection. Let's look at the concordant literal translation of this section in 1 Timothy 4, 12 through 18. Now, we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are reposing, dying, lest you may, that those who have died, that you may sorrow lest you may sorrow according to the rest, also who have no expectation. The world has no hope. We have rich hope, abundant hope. So we aren't going to grieve as much as those who don't have hope. We still miss the person. We miss being with them, uh, everything about it. And it makes us sad and we grieve, but not like those who don't even know they're going to see them again, right? We, we, can't, we can't grieve as much as them because we know we're going to see that person again. So if we are believing that Jesus died and rose, those also, thus also those who are put to repose, those who die in Christ before he returns, will God through Jesus lead forth together with him, lead forth together with him. For this we are saying to you by the word of the Lord, that we, the living, who are surviving to the presence of the Lord, should by no means outstrip those who are put to repose. For the Lord himself will be descending from heaven with a shout of command, with the voice of the chief messenger, that's Jesus, his voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall be rising first. Jesus Christ is going to call us himself from the dead. Isn't that great? And the trumpet, remember, is the trumpet of God. Therefore, so Jesus Christ blows the trumpet of God, and he announces, he, he calls the dead to life, and then uh, meets us in the air. Therefore, we, the living who are surviving, shall at the same time be snatched away together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be together with the Lord. So that console one another with these words. In the King James Version of 1 Thessalonians 4.17, will be caught away is translated. Uh, in the King James Version of 1 Thessalonians 4.17, our Pazzo is translated, will be caught away. The proper translation is in the concordant literal translation is snatched away. The destination of those snatched away is then given to be in the clouds. In 1 Thessalonians, it states that. <clears throat> and in the air here in First Thessalonians. This is obviously not on earth. We are noting this for further discussion as we proceed. At some point in time, those saints who have already died and those who are alive at the exact time Christ returns will be snatched away to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next section of scripture in First Thessalonians drills down on the timing of this wondrous event. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Notice I've bolded the pronoun so you can see who it's talking to. This obviously is talking to believers. Brethren, you brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So we're talking about the day of the Lord here. For when they shall say peace and safety... Then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, you're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are children of light and the children of the day. 
We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Let us watch and be sober. Now, this sleep here, and in, in, you can tell in the context here, this is talking about being alive. So it, it literally means sleep here. Don't be asleep on the job, in other words. Let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. <clears throat> for God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep in our walks, whether we're alert or not, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as you also do. So this pinpoints when it's going to happen. Let's look at the concordant literal translation of that same section. First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. Now, concerning the times and eras, brethren, you have no need that, to be written unto, for you yourselves are accurately aware that the day of the Lord is as a thief in the night. Thus it is coming. Now, whenever they may be saying peace and security, then extermination is standing by them unawares, even as a paying over to pregnant, and they may by no means escape. Now, you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day may, may be overtaking you as a thief. You're not in darkness. You are all sons of the light, sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Consequently, then, we may not be drowsing, even as the rest, but we may be watching and be sober. For those who are drowsing are drowsing at night. Those who are drunk are drunk at night. Yet we, being of the day, may be sober, putting on the curious, curious of faith and love, and the helmet, the expectation of salvation. For God did not appoint us to indignation, that's the word for wrath, but to the procuring of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sakes, that whether we may be watching or drowsing, we should be living at the same time together with him. Wherefore, console one another and edify one another according as you are also doing. Notice the we and the them pronouns. Two separate groups of people are being discussed, believers in the current administration of God's government and unbelievers. Paul, of course, is speaking to the saints, the believers, saying using we, us, our. The companion text is found in Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15. In this passage, Paul reveals a mystery or a secret that had never been revealed before. Since it had never been revealed before, it obviously cannot be found in any scripture that predates this revelation to the Apostle Paul. A yeah, secret can't be known until it's revealed, right? If God kept some secret, nobody could know it. So you can't find it in the Old Testament, in the Law and Prophets. You can't find it in the Gospels when our Lord spoke, or it would have been revealed. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58, it's the King James Version. Behold, I show you a secret, mysterion. That Greek, that Greek word mysterion meant secret. Mystery is a transliteration. Transliteration is when you take the word and put it in the letters uh, of the new language you're translating to, mysterion. But it literally means secret. We, once a secret's revealed, it's no longer a secret. It's known. So here's the secret revealed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This is talking about the same event that Paul related by the word of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians 4. So, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, an eye that's quick, that's quicker than a blink, it's quicker than a half blink. At the last trump, for the, that's the trump of God, remember. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, the one who has died already in Christ, must put on incorruption. And this mortal, the one who is alive at the time of Christ's return, must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, when the dead in Christ have been raised and have 
put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality when those alive are gathered together with those who have died and meet the Lord in the air and receive that immortal body. Then shall be brought to pass a saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, like I said, the Greek word mysterion is transliterated, not translated into the English mystery. It should be translated as secret. That's what the Greek word means. Once a secret's revealed, it's no longer a secret. There's nothing mysterious about this secret. It was just not revealed until God wanted it to be. So look at the concordant version of that section, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. Lo, a secret to you am I telling. We all indeed shall not be put to repose. We're not all going to die, but we shall all be changed. In an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For he will be trumpeting, Christ himself, and the dead will be roused incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. The one who has died in Christ must put on incorruptible body. The one who is alive and remain when Christ returns must put on immortality. Now, whenever this corruptible shall be putting on incorruption, and this mortal shall be putting on immortality, then shall come to pass the word which is written, swallowed up was death in by victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Or where, O oh, death, is your sting? Now, the sting of death is sin. We sin because we're mortal. That's what that verse means. The sting of death is that we sin. Yet the power of sin is the law. That's what makes sin known. Now, thanks be to God who is giving us believers, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that my beloved brethren become settled, unmovable, super abounding in the work of the Lord always, being aware that your toil is not for naught in the Lord. I summarized some points about this snatching away in those three sections. And here how, here's how it looks. We notice the following facts about this event. At some point in time, the Lord shall return to the earth's atmosphere, in the clouds, in the air. The Lord himself will shout a, a shout of command with his own voice, the voice of the chief messenger. It says uh, archangel in Thessalonians. It's the chief messenger who is Christ. The trumpet of God shall sound. The dead in Christ rise from the dead first. Those saints who are alive at that exact moment will be snatched away together with them. The meeting will be in the clouds and in the air. The saints will receive a spiritual celestial body being changed in an instant. The saints will always be with the Lord from that moment on. We are to comfort and console one another with these words, and we are to labor in the Lord unfalteringly because we have such hope. Paul introduces this section as coming from the Lord himself. For this we are saying to you by the word of the Lord. That's uh, the section in 1 Thessalonians. Paul had previously taught them the coming of the Lord from the province of Israel. Now he was adjusting the saints to this new revelation that came directly from the Lord. To introduce this revelation, Paul deliberately tells them it's not from him, but from the Lord. The timing of this event, the rapture or our snatching away, is further delineated in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and is referenced in 2 Thessalonians 5. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 15, King James. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that's the harpazo, the snatching away, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand, it says in King James. But in Four of the critical, oldest critical Greek texts, this reads, the day of the Lord. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, the day of the Lord shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. 
who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was with you, yet I told you these things? Now that's quite a statement, because Paul got the revelation about this, and then he gave it. But before that, there was no revelation of a separate inheritance for believers uh, outside of Israel. So Israel kingdoms held in abeyance. God gives new revelation, and this is talking about that. There's new, new rules, new plan, uh, new exit strategy, you might say, huh, off the earth. But Paul had told them about the Old Testament prophecies before he got the revelation on the new one. So he told them about all this stuff, and now he's adjusting it uh, to show them they're going to get out before Israel. Now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. So here, what withholds what? We'll find out. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now and letteth is the same word as withholdeth. I don't know why they translate it different, but it's the same word. It actually means to restrain. I'll read it like that. You know what restrains is something that restrains here. And who restrains here? So it's something, and here it's a who. You know what res restrains, and he might, he might be revealed in his time. Who's he? This man of wickedness, this uh, the man of sin being revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So now you know what restrains that he might be revealed in his time, not in our time, in his time, his era, not our. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets or restrains, the same word as withhold, will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness, uh, in unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, since they didn't receive the truth, God shall send them strong delusion and, uh, that they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned who believe not in the truth. And the word damned is judge in, in uh, the Greek, that they might be judged who believe not the truth but had pleasure in righteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our gospel, not the kingdom gospel. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold the traditions which you have been taught by Paul, not by the Old Testament people, whether by word or by our epistle. That's where they get it from. The traditions Paul taught by word or by his epistle, not the Old Testament traditions. So King, King James Version has Day of Christ here that we read right off the, the bat here in uh, uh, verse 16, that the Day of Christ is at hand. But the oldest manuscripts have Day of the Lord, as it, as it is translated in the Revised Version. This is in harmony with the textual critics, Griesbeck, Lachman, Tischendorf, and Tregelis and Hort. The Day of Christ is used twice and refers to the rapture event when we are gathered together unto him. While the Day of the Lord is connected with the Lord's return to the earth, as prophesied in the Law and Prophets to judge the world. The two places where the day of Christ are used is as follows. Philippians 1.6 Being confident in this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The texts read the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 2.14-16 Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world.
holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That's when Christ returns and gathers us to himself, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We'll read the concordant version of that same section. I, now we are asking you, brethren, for the sake of the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and our assembling to him, that you be not quickly shaken from your mind, nor yet alarmed, even through spirit, either through spirit or through word or through an epistle as though from us, as that the day of the Lord is present. Don't let anybody fool you. No one should be deluding you by any method, for should not the apostasy be coming first and the man of lawlessness be unveiled, the sons of destruction, who is opposing and letting himself up, lifting himself up over every one term to God or an object of veneration, so that he is seated in a temple of God, demonstrating that he himself is God. So all this stuff has to happen for the day of the Lord to happen. Do you not remember this being, still being with you? I told you these things. And now you are aware what is detaining for him to be unveiled in his own era. The Antichrist will be unveiled, this man of sin, in his own era, not in ours. For the secret of lawlessness is already operating. Only when the present detainer may be coming to be out of the midst, then will be unveiled that lawless one, whom the Lord Jesus will dispatch with the spirit of his mouth and will discard by the advent of his presence, whose presence is in accord with the operation of Satan, with all powers and signs and false miracles, and with every seduction of injustice among those who are perishing, because they do not receive the love of the truth for their salvation. And therefore, God will be sending them in operation of deception for them to believe the falsehood, that all may be judged who do not believe the truth, but delight in injustice. Now, we ought to be thanking God always concerning you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, seeing that God prefers you to the beginning for salvation and holiness of the spirit and faith in the truth, into which he also calls us through our evangel, not theirs, for the procuring of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're called to glory. Consequently, then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, through whether through word or our epistle. I noticed these observations about our snatching away, about the timing of the snatching away. Number one, the day of the Lord does not commence until the body of Christ is snatched away to meet the Lord in the clouds in the air. Two, the day of the Lord will be apparent because the apostasy will come first and the man of lawlessness will be unveiled. Three, this man of lawlessness is being detained and won't be revealed until we are in his own area, era. Until his own area. We're not going to ever be in that era. This is different from the era we currently live in, which is the era of the grace of God. His own era is that of judgment, and it follows this one. The man of lawlessness will dispatch the man, this man, the Lord Jesus will dispatch with the spirit of his mouth and will discard by the advent of his presence. Jesus has to come to the earth to do this. And then he fights him with the sword of his mouth and wins. Five, God prefers the saints from the beginning for salvation, not for wrath. Six, when they unbelievers may be saying peace and security, then extermination is standing by them unawares, even as a pang over the pregnant. And they by no means will be able to escape. But now you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day may be overtaking you as a thief. Why? We're children of light, right? This has to be before even the great tribulation, which precedes the day of the Lord, wherein God's wrath is revealed from heaven. There will be no peace and safety during the great tribulation or during the wrath of God. If the rapture occurs at the midpoint, let's say three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation to come, it will not be at a time of peace and safety. They won't be saying anything about peace and safety at that time. Chaos will have come upon the earth at that time. Seven, those snatched away do not believe the truth but delight in injustice. The Apostle Paul calls this the snatching away of pre those not snatched away do not believe the truth, but delight in injustice. Sorry about that. The Apostle Paul calls the snatching away a pre-expectation in Ephesians. Ephesians 1.12, concordant literal version, that we should be for the Lord of his glory, who are the pre-expectant in the Christ. 
It's called a pre-expectation because it precedes Christ's return to Israel and was announced before it was revealed to the Apostle Paul. This is the promise of Christ that is jointly shared by both Jew and Gentile in the body of Christ. In Ephesians 3, 6, you can read that. Um, so this uh, pre-expectation was unannounced before it was revealed to the Apostle Paul. It's the promise of Christ that's referred to in Ephesians 3, 6. The body of Christ is separate from Israel. Are you aware of that? The body of Christ is not and never will be the nation of Israel. Israel rejected the Lord Jesus in his personal ministry. They also rejected him in the book of Acts after his resurrection. Because of this, their kingdom has been held in abeyance until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Romans 11.25 for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this secret, this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. The reason for all the views of Christ's second coming is because of the failure to recognize the different administrations in God's word. It's really very easy to sort out which view is correct when you rightly divide God's word. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved, rightly unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. As to the administrations, an administration is a period of God's rule distinguished from other administrations. Before the law, the written law was given to Israel, they were not under it. When it was given, they were made subject to it. It's the change of administration that effected this. When Israel rejected the resurrected Lord Jesus during the Pentecostal administration, that's during the period covered by the book of Acts, their kingdom was held in abeyance. At that time, the administration of the secret began. That is when Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians were written. These epistles reveal and expound upon the secret of Christ and on the administration of the secret. This is the administration during which we live now until our Lord's return and our gathering together unto him at the snatching away or the rapture. During this period of time, God is not dealing with Israel, but with the Gentiles and only a small remnant of Israel. That's this time we live in now. Those are coming into the body of Christ and are no longer Jew or Gentile, but are of the church of God. This change in identity removes them from the promises given to Israel to the singular promise in Christ given to the Apostle Paul, which is the rapture or the snatching away. The present-day church, the body of Christ, was not the subject of Old Testament prophecy, cannot be found anywhere in the Law and Prophets, in the four accounts of our Lord, which they call the Gospels, or in the book of Acts, until we get to the 13th chapter, where Paul is severed to go unto the Gentiles. That was the start of the body of Christ, which was separate from Israel. The body of Christ is a new creation in Christ. I have an article in the supplemental materials section of this book uh, where I go into um, uh, where I go into this separation of the body of Christ from Israel. 2 Corinthians 5.17, the body of Christ is a new creation in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The body of Christ is also the start of the new humanity in Christ as revealed in Ephesians. Ephesians 2.11-16, through 16, wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision and the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's the state of Gentiles before the conciliation, before God conciliated himself to man. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes were far off or made nigh next of kin, by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who has made both one, Jew and Gentile, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, to make himself of twain, of two, one new man, 
that's the one new humanity in Christ, so making peace that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. God deliberately split up Jews and Gentiles in the Old Testament to achieve his purposes. Uh, his ultimate purpose in the end puts them back together, Jew and Gentile equal, and that's happened already in the body of Christ. God deals with his church, the body of Christ, separately from the nation of Israel. He removes the church from earth before the day of the Lord begins. Just as he saved the eight people from Noah's family on the ark before the deluge, he will save his blessed church from that terrible day of the Lord to come. The rapture of the saints is the event that takes place on that sacred day of redemption for the body of Christ. We have a glorious hope, we saints do. The snatching away, or rapture, is the culminating event of the administration of the secret during which we presently live. In this event, Christ raises those who have died in Christ, as believers, in other words, and those who are alive at that instant in time to meet him in the air. He will give them incorruptible, immortal bodies that are spiritual and celestial, suited for life in the celestial realm. That body is like Jesus' glorified body that he has now. 1 Corinthians, uh, oh, this is a mistake, sorry. Philippians chapter 3 20 and 21. For our realm is inherent in the heavens, out of which we are waiting a Savior also, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transfigure the body of our humiliation, these fleshy bodies we got now, to conform it to the body of his glory, in accord with the operation which enables him even to subject all to himself. So our, the body we're going to get is fashioned just like Christ's glorified body that he has now. It's not suited to living on the earth. It's suited to living in the celestial sphere, and that's our allotment. That's our jurisdiction. We are going to displace the angels, be above them. And a lot of them are not very happy about that right now. So we already read 1 Corinthians 15. I'll leave it here. Uh, oh, we didn't read this part. 15, 42 through 58 of 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 58. Thus also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. A body we have is corruptible. It corrupts. It dies. It's going to be replaced with an incorruptible one. It is sown in dishonor. It's roused in glory. It is sown in infirmity. It is raised in power. It is sown a soulish body where the soul controls everything. It has roused a spiritual body where God's spirit takes control or actually uh, navigates. If there is a soulish body, there's a spiritual one also. Thus it is written also, the first man, Adam, became a living soul, the last Adam, a vivifying spirit. But not first the spiritual, but the soulish, thereupon the spiritual. The first man was out of the earth, soilish. The second man is the Lord out of heaven. Such as the soilish one is, such are those who are also soilish, and such as the celestial one, such are those that are also celestials. And according as we wear the image of the soilish now, we should be wearing the image also of the celestial then. Now this is an, this I am averring, brethren, that flesh and blood is not able to enjoy an allotment in the kingdom of God. Neither is corruption enjoying allotment of incorruption. Lo, a secret to you am I telling, I am telling you. We all indeed shall not be put to repose. We're not all going to die, all, all believers, in this period of time. We're not all going to die, yet we sh all shall be changed in an instant, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trump. For he will be trumpeting, and the dead will be roused incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal put on immortality, now, whenever this corruptible should be putting on incorruption and this mortal should be putting on immortality, then shall come to pass the word which is written, swallowed up was death and victory, by victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Now, the sting of death is sin, yet the power of sin is in the law. Now, thanks be to God who is, is giving us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that, brethren beloved, Become settled, unmovable, superabounding in the work of the Lord always, being aware that your toil is not for naught in the Lord. 
So the believer's blessed hope refers to all God has promised to his church, which is the body of Christ, and focuses on his return and includes, one, our gathering together unto him at the rapture, the snatching away, the afore of the day of the Lord, and the wrath of God. Two, our change from soilless to incorruptible, immortal, spiritual, and celestial bodies suited for life in the celestial realm. There we go. Three, rewards for faithful living and service or the withholding of rewards for failing to live up to God's standards and for not building on a foundation of Jesus Christ was laid by the Apostle Paul. Well, four, our citizenship in the celestial realm, not on earth. Five, our reigning with Christ in the celestial kingdom. These functions only go to those who endure now during the present administration. Not to everybody, the reigning with part. Six, our job during the next two eons is to be displayed as the gems of God's grace to the principalities, powers, mights, and dominions, that is, to the spiritual rulers on high, with the purpose to bring them back into God's fold, to reconcile the errant spiritual realm back to God through Christ. Our participation in judging man and spiritual messengers or angels at the great white throne is number seven. So this is our hope, our blessed hope, all seven of these things. These are the realities God will cause to happen that give us hope in this present evil world. By focusing on what we will, will be, as promised by God, the believer can stand strong, always toiling in the work of the Lord, no matter what obstacles and oppressions and persecutions face them. So some conclusions about what we've looked at about the rapture. The rapture or the snatching away of Christians, both those who have died and those who are alive, instantaneously as one body, is a promise given to the body of Christ. Since the body of Christ had never been revealed, the snatching away could not have been either. When Israel rejected the risen Christ in the book of Acts, God held their kingdom in abeyance and formed a new humanity by removing the division he earlier placed between Israel and the Gentiles. There could be no new humanity with Jews and Gentiles divided. That division was caused by God himself to achieve his master plan of redemption and is removed by him in accord with his counsels to the earth. In the final state, all mankind will be equal in Christ, with God being all in all. So we won't have any preference, any division. The body of Christ is a completely separate entity from the Church of Israel, which is called the Church of the Circumcision. God has given it a completely different allotment, inheritance, and jurisdiction. The celestial or heavenly realm is ours. Israel will inherit the earth and earthly jurisdiction. The body of Christ is separate, and God completely removes it before once again dealing with Israel, which is what the, unveil, the unveiling or the book of Revelation and the end time sequence given to the prophets are all about. The unveiling shows God fulfilling his promises to the fathers of Israel and to David. It has nothing to do with the body of Christ. Believers will not be subject to the mark of the beast, which comes before the Lord's return. They have already been judged in Christ. The body of Christ, which is the church of God, will be resting in heaven while the day of the Lord shakes the earth one last time. Praise God for his gracious provision for those who believe during the administration of the secret. The blessed hope which God has given to the body of Christ gives strength to each individual believer to stand strong and endure in this evil world. At the exact moment, God has already decided Christ will return to the atmosphere of the earth and will raise those who have died in Christ and those who are alive at that time to himself. These will then enter the celestial realm. They will be above the angels because Christ has been made Lord of all and the body of Christ is in Christ. What privileges God has reserved for the body of Christ. Let us learn and be thankful. Now, the last thing I want to do today is go through this short list of objections that I've seen and heard raised concerning the rapture. So I compiled this list of objections as I searched the internet for people's views concerning the rapture. 
and many of them I've heard myself. I just didn't want to miss out on any. You may have heard of other ones. Let me know. One, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. Really? Answer, it is in the Bible. It's in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, where the Greek word translated harpazo, translated caught away in KJV, appears. The Greek word harpazo is translated by the Latin word rapturo in the Latin Vulgate, which means to snatch away. See the section on what is the rapture for details. Either word can be accurately used to refer to the same event, rapture or snatch away. Two, why do we think we'll escape the persecution when so many fellow, fellow Christians are being tortured or killed for their faith? Shouldn't we be willing to endure the tribulation? Of course we should be willing to endure anything for our Lord. Should we want to? No, that would be a suicide. Answer, the promise of the rapture doesn't mean the saints will not experience persecution. It does mean the saints of the same of this period of time, the administration of the secret, will be snatched away before the day of the Lord, which includes the wrath of God. Beware of false humility that leads to pride. Nobody should want to go through any kind of persecution. All should be willing, but none should desire it. Number three, if you believe in the pre-tribulation pre -tribulation rapture position, you have an escape mentality. You are selfish and don't care about humanity. Answer, again, beware, be aware of false humility. I imagine Noah had an escape mentality also, and God wanted him to escape. That's why God told Noah to build the ark. The proper mentality is to want what God wants. He wants us to take, he wants to take us off the earth before he declares war on his enemies. We should want the same. Four, this doctrine was not mentioned in any Christian literature before 1830. Oh, this is a big one nowadays. A young Scottish girl named Margaret MacDonald invented it by wrongly dividing God's word. Then John Nelson Darby, a 19th century theologian, further strengthened this false doctrine in 1833. Have you ever heard anything like that before? That the rapture isn't true. This lady, this uh, girl named Margaret MacDonald came up with it. The answer is simply it's not true. The word rapture is rapturo in the Latin Vulgate. It's harpazo in the Greek. Since it appears in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, it is obviously in God's word from when Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians. I want to get this to the same line. This objection does not deal with scripture. It's a genetic fallacy. A genetic fallacy is a reason, a failure to reason correctly. It's when someone attempts to argue against a position by explaining the origin of the belief instead of the essence of the position. The pre, um, the pre tribulation rapture doctrine does have precedent in the early church. And I've got Irenaeus against heresies 529 1b right here. Those nations, however, who do not rid themselves, who did not of themselves raise up their eyes unto heaven, nor return thanks to their maker, nor wish to behold the light of truth, but who were like blind mice concealed in the depths of ignorance, the word justly recognize, reckons as waste water from a sink, and as the turning weight of a balance, in fact, is nothing. So far useful, so far as useful, far useful and first serviceable to the just, as stubble conduces towards the growth of the wheat and its straw by means of combustion serves for working for gold. And therefore, when in the end, the church shall be suddenly caught up from this, it is said there shall be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning, neither shall be. So we can see Irenaeus uh, teaching this very early, that the church would be caught up, caught away, harpazo, from this uselessness on the earth. Um, number five, the objection number five, the return of Jesus to the earth is the same as his return for the church. He meets the saints in the air and immediately returns to the earth with the church. This is the first resurrection. Really? <laughs> I say it again. 
Answer, Jesus doesn't come back, come in the clouds, raise the Christians and the righteous of Israel who have died to meet him in the air and then return to the earth with them. This objection is refuted by the fact that the first resurrection does not happen until after Jesus returns to the earth. Jesus does not raise the dead until 75 days after his return to the earth. While those saints that are alive on the earth at his return are immediately ushered into the kingdom, Jesus inaugurates. So see the section in this book earlier on the timing of the resurrection of the just, which we covered last week to see the 75 delay, day delay from Jesus' return to the earth to when he raises the dead at the first resurrection. The event Paul describes in 1 Thessalonians 4 is quite different. Both the dead in Christ, that's believers who have died, and those alive at the timing of that event are gathered unto the Lord at once, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That is quicker than a half blink. The dead are raised an instantaneous fraction of a second later. Those who are alive are changed and ascend with those who are dead to meet the Lord in the air. In 1 Thessalonians 4, there is no time lag between the saint, when the saints are glorified and when the dead are raised and glorified. Those who are raised at the first resurrection are made priests and kings to the nations. There are no priests in the body of Christ. There are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, Ephesians 4.11. Those in the body of Christ, by necessity then, are excluded from the first resurrection. Why? Because we're not priests and kings. We never will be. No priests and kings will come out of those in the new humanity in Christ because, one, the body of Christ is completely separate from the nation of Israel, which inherits the jurisdiction of the earth, and, two, the body of Christ inherits the jurisdiction of the celestial sphere where no nations exist. So we don't need priests and kings. There is only one second coming of Christ. The rapture adds a third coming of Christ. Okay. Answer. This arises out of an inaccurate understanding of the progression of revelation from the Lord's ministry through the book of Acts and into Paul's ministry. The rapture was a secret held from before the creation of the earth by God. It's not revealed in any of the prophetic writings, so don't expect to find it there. By necessity is a new revelation. So yes, it does add another, add a, another aspect of second, Christ's second coming that was before unknown and unknowable because it adds to God's revelation and is no grounds for objection because that is the object of revelation to add to our knowledge and understanding of God's will so it got added in it was kept secret from before the foundation of the earth the disruption of the earth so yeah there's only two revealed in the whole Old Testament but this is a third one in a way, it's a it's part res, part resurrection, part just changing alive people, uh, an out resurrection. Paul calls it. Now, coming when it's used of the Lord's return is a Greek word parousia, and it means the arrival of someone in their personal presence. They're personally present in the arrival. They're not sending a delegate to get somebody. They're coming themselves. That's parousia. Parousia covers a period of time. It's not a one-time event. So Parisia includes all the events of the end time scenario, beginning with the Lord's return to meet the church in the air, all the way through his touchdown on the Mount of Olives for Israel. God did not reveal the first aspect of his son's second coming to ensure the integrity of his plan. So he didn't reveal the rapture, the snatching away, to preserve and ensure the integrity of his plan. Seven, the rapture is not historical, traditional church doctrine. That's an objection that people raise against the rapture. It's not historical. It's not traditional church doctrine. Answer, we ought to consult and believe God's word, not man's tradition. Jesus strongly criticized the tradition of the elders and said it made the word of God of none effect. It does not matter if the rapture was never taught. If it is in the word of God, which it is, it needs to be learned, understood, and taught. Number eight, it's doomsday hysteria. Answer, this is a straw man fallacy. It's not doomsday, but redemption day, when the saints shall be fully redeemed and will be given a new spiritual body. Objection nine, there isn't a secret rapture because 1 Thessalonians 4 teaches a very public event. <clears throat> Answer, the term secret rapture is misleading. The Bible doesn't use it. God's word doesn't use secret rapture. 
the event of the rapture was kept secret by God so its plan would not be compromised. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. We'll read it in a minute. This is why it cannot be found in the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, or in the four accounts of our Lord, which they call the Gospels. Now that now that secret has been revealed, and it's no longer a secret, 1 Corinthians 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a secret, a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This secret is one of the five secrets revealed to and through the Apostle Paul. See my book on the secret of, of Christ revealed for details. This should be secret of Christ revealed. You can download any of my books from Live Faith TV. Click on the Richard's Book tab in the upper uh, menu. Uh, secret of Christ revealed. A very good work. Luke 17 refers to the rapture, and so does Matthew 24, say some people. This is objection 10. Answer, the rapture was one of the secrets revealed to the Apostle Paul, and therefore could not have been spoken of or written about before it was revealed. You can't find the rapture in any writing that predates Paul's epistles. In both Luke 17, 34 through 36, and Matthew 24, 37 through 44, speak of one being taken and one being left behind. The ones being taken refer to the unrighteous, not the righteous. The comparison is to those at Noah's time who were swept away or taken, snatched away by the flood. See the section in the body of this work on the Lord's second coming as prophesied from ancient times for clarification. Objection 11. We're almost finished here. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul just talks about one event. If there were two comings of Christ, this would be the place to explain it. Well, answer, this is a or misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians 15 and a misrepresentation. It doesn't talk about one event there. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28, it lays out the entire sequence of how God will make all who die in Adam alive in Christ. The details are not given, just the outline. The subject is specifically resurrection and being made alive. All die in Adam, and all will be made alive beyond the reach of death in Christ. It will be done in three stages. Christ the first fruits, those who are alive at Christ's coming, that's the perusia, and then the rest of the end or the consummation, which concludes the Ionian times. So uh, remember, perusia is all the events of the Lord's turn, from meeting us in the air to when he steps down on the Mount of Olives. So both aspects of that are apparent when Christ comes for uh, his church. Um, those who are Christ. When he comes for those who are his, this perusia includes both the gathering together, our rapture, our uh, snatching away to the Lord and his return to Israel. Then the rest will come in at the end of the consummation which concludes the Ionian times. So if you're not familiar with this term, Ionian times or eons, uh, I encourage you to take my course called the Ionian times on my YouTube channel, which is Faith Igniter. You can use the link in this book or just go to YouTube and search for Faith Igniter, I-G-N-I-T-O-R, not E-R, O-R, Faith Igniter. There is a playlist for it there. See the chart on 1 Corinthians 15. I showed it earlier. I'll show it again in a minute. Objection 12. Jesus didn't teach it. Of course. Correct. Let me bold this. Correct. The rapture was one of the secrets revealed to the Apostle Paul. Therefore, it could not have been spoken of or written about before it was revealed. You cannot find the rapture in any writing that predates Paul's epistles. However, Jesus does teach it because we reveal it's the Apostle Paul as recorded in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. Paul received it by the word of the Lord from Jesus Christ. So it is Jesus Christ teaching it. 13. The resurrection of the dead is going to happen when Jesus returns. This is when the great white throne of judgment will occur, Revelation 20, and when the sheep will be separated from the goats. Answer, incorrect. There's a bunch wrong with that. The resurrection of the dead, the just dead, 
the first resurrection, occurs 75 days after the return of Jesus to the earth. The saints that are alive and are admitted into the kingdom before the dead are raised. Those saints are admitted to the kingdom before the dead are even raised. But in 1 Thessalonians 4, both the dead and alive saints are caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds, in the air. The great white throne judgment does not occur until 1,000 years after the sheep and goats judgment recorded in Matthew 25, which is the judgment of the nations. The sheep and the goats judgment is not the final judgment. The white throne judgment is 1,000 years later. Uh, there's only 15. So 14, the trumpet of God is the same as the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation. And it's called the last trumpet, so there cannot be two separate events with the same trumpet. There can only be one last trump. Answer, the trumpet of God in 1 Corinthians 15.52 and also in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. And the seventh trumpet in Revelation 11.15 cannot be the same trumpet. The two trumpets may be similar, but they are not identical. The seventh trumpet sounds all the time the seven vials of God's wrath is poured out on the earth. That's quite a while. And there is no resurrection mentioned in those seven vials. Christ is not even returned at that point in the end time scenario. He's got to return to raise the dead. The seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation sends the wrath of God upon the earth through the seven bowls or vials and is called the third woe. This is not a celebratory trumpet of victory for the saints, but a trumpet sounding judgment of the world. Regarding the objection that there cannot be more than one last trump, the scriptures disagree. There were many trumpets for various purposes in the Old Testament. The last trumpet is the last one in a series, but there can be more than one uh, series. Also, the last trumpet can also be the first and last if there is only one. See the section on the timing of the resurrection of the just for more details. The final objection, there is only one final judgment, so there's only one resurrection of both the just and the unjust. All will appear before the great white throne. This is amillennialism again. Those who raise this objection simply cannot or refuse to read what is written. There's a thousand-year gap between the first resurrection and the final resurrection in the book of Revelation. Then how can it be one event? It is undeniable. These are the same people who try to convince us there will be no millennial kingdom of Christ that lasts a thousand years. They have been deceived into believing we are living in the millennium now. Yet none of the visions given to us as a glorious millennium are in sight yet. I have a small chart in here on the comparison of the trump of the rapture and the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation. Uh, in this column, I got the last trumpet of 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and 1 Thessalonians 15.52. In the last column here, I got the seventh trumpet of, trumpet of Revelation. So these trumpets, who are they sounded by? The one in the Pauline epistles is sounded by the chief messenger, Christ himself. In uh, the book of Revelation, the seventh trumpet there is sounded by an angel. When is it sounded? In Pauline epistles, before the day of the Lord. In the, in the book of Revelation for Israel, during the day of the Lord. Who is this trump heard by? In Pauline epistles, only the body of Christ's saints, dead and alive. But in the seventh trumpet, it's not specified. If anybody hears it, it's just somebody pours out vials of wrath after it's sounded terms used and uh the term used is the trump of god when it's talking when paul's talking about the rapture the trump of god this is associated with the voice of the chief messenger who is christ christ blows both blows the trumpet and issues the command to come up here in uh the revelation it's the seventh angel that sounds is his trumpet not god trump of god but his trumpet which is the third woe. And again, no resurrection occurs when that seventh trumpet is sounded. What triggers the action and the event in uh, the Pauline epistles, talking about the rapture, the saints of the, are the, of the body of Christ are immediately snatched away and changed. Dead and alive in Christ are the only ones included. 
But in Revelation, the seven vials of God's wrath are poured out on the earth. The resurrection of the just, which is the first or the former resurrection, does not happen for quite a while after the vials end. So you see the differences. They can't be the same. Now, let's look at the rapture with Christ's return to the earth. Last week, we looked at Christ's return to the earth. This week, we looked at the rapture. Let's compare them in this short chart. In the first column, we have the element we're comparing. In the second, we have the rapture. In the third, we have Christ's return to the earth for Israel. When it occurs, the rapture occurs before the tribulation. Christ's return to the earth immediately after the tribulation. Location and appearance of Christ. With the rapture, it's in the clouds, in the air. With Christ's return to the earth, it's Mount of Olives, splits a mountain in two on touchdown. Who is raised in the rapture? The entire body of Christ, both the dead and the living. And uh, uh, in the book of Revelation, the first resurrection, none are raised until 75 days after the Lord's return. Then the righteous dead, Israel and Gentile proselytes from all ages, outside the administration of the secret, are raised. Nothing about the body of Christ there in that resurrection of the just. The element, allotment, or inheritance and jurisdiction. The rapture for the saints is the celestial realm, heaven. Christ's return to the earth for Israel is the earth. They inherit the earth. What body do they receive? In the rapture, uh, we receive a celestial spiritual required to live in the celestial realm, a celestial and spiritual body. But with Christ's return to the earth, Israel gets an earthly but powerful body required to live in the terrestrial realm. Uh, how about citizenship? In the, with uh, the, the Church of Grace, the Church of Christ, the celestial realm or heaven is our citizenship. And uh, for Israel, it's the earth. What's our job? And for the church, it's to, to be displayed as the gems of God's grace, reconciling through Christ the errant messengers or angels in the celestial realm. What's Israel's job? Priests and kings to the nations, baptize and disciple the nations. So you can see from these two, from us uh, reconciling those in the celestial realm and Israel re recognizing people in the earthly realm, the terrestrial realm, by this, God is able to um, reconcile all in heaven and earth to himself, which is Colossians 1.20. We do the heavenly part, the church of God. Israel does the earthly part. Now, on this chart of our Lord's coming, I just wanted to point out this second part here. Those that are at Christ's coming, the church meets the Lord in the air, and then Christ returns to the earth here. That's when he, the resurrection that just happens, and Israel is saved. You can see they're divided. They're two separate events is the point. This chart, by the way, is part of my Eonian Times charts. You can download from Light Faith TV. A lot of good charts in there that explain it better than words sometimes. So we got one more thing to do today. I know it's been a while. But testing the various views of the second coming of Christ with the scriptures. And this is going to be brief. I listed the various views of the second coming of Christ in the first chapter. Here we will compare them to scripture to see which is taught by God's word. First of all, covering the entire end time period, we have three. We have premillennialism. This says the Lord will return for the body of Christ before he inaugurates his millennial kingdom. Is this view valid? Yes. God pulls the body of Christ, a separate entity from Israel, from the earth before the day of the Lord even begins. God removes his ambassadors of peace before he visits his wrath upon the earth. View two, post-millennialism. The Lord will return for the body of Christ after the church on earth reigns for a thousand years. Is this view valid? No. Those who think the body of Christ is reigning on the earth now are blind to the apostasy in Christendom at large. Man will never solve earth's problems and judge in righteousness on the earth. Christ must return to set things right. The entire purpose of this third evil eon in which Satan is the god of this eon, is to prove man cannot judge justly. So no, post-millennialism is not an option. It's not valid. Amillennialism. Amillennialism teaches that from the ascension of Christ in the first century until the second coming, uh, and there is no rapture with this view, just during that time, both good and evil will increase in the world as God's kingdom parallels Satan's kingdom. 
when Jesus returns at the end of the world, uh, when Jesus returns, the end of the world will occur with a general resurrection and general judgment of all people. It is essentially a spiritualization of the kingdom prophecies. Is this view valid? No. This view spiritualizes the scriptures and causes all kinds of contradictions within it. There is not one general resurrection and or general judgment of all the people, as evidenced by the several judgments of different groups of people revealed in God's word. All those judgments cannot be amalgamated into one and still preserve the integrity of God's word. Then in regard to the rapture itself, people teach a pre-tribulation rapture. The Lord will return and gather the body of Christ to himself, both dead alive and alive, before he returns to the earth through Israel. In this view, both the tribulation, the first three and a half years of that seven-year covenant that the Antichrist signs, and the great tribulation, the last three and a half years, and the wrath of God, which occurs during the last three and a half years, occur after the body of Christ is removed from the earth. Is this view valid? Yes. The rapture or snatching away is the pre-expectation referred to in Ephesians 1.12, that we should be for the lot of his glory who are the pre-expectant in the Christ. God removes his ambassadors before he declares war on the nations. This is in accord with God's grace in this administration of the secret now current. Seven, mid-tribulation rapture. The Lord will return for the body of Christ halfway, that's after three and a half years, during the seven-year period spoken of in the book of Revelation. This view states the body of Christ will go through the tribulation, which is defined as the first three and a half years of the Antichrist reign, but will be removed, the church will be removed when the Antichrist reneges on his seven-year covenant signed with Israel. Is this view valid? No. The body of Christ is not found in the book of Revelation at all. It is taken up before the seven-year covenant is even confirmed. Eight, the pre-wrath rapture. The Lord will return for the body of Christ halfway through the last three and a half years of the seven-year period spoken in the book of Revelation. So this is a little later than the mid-tribulation rapture. Is this view valid? No. The body of Christ is saved from the day of wrath of God Almighty, not taken out in the middle of it. Nine, post-tribulation rapture. Does the rapture occur after the tribulation? The Lord will return for the, both the body of Christ and for Israel at the end of the great tribulation, also called the time of Jacob's trouble, after the wrath of God. Is this view valid? No. Post-tribulation places the rapture by necessity after the wrath of God, which the body of Christ is saved from. The body of Christ must be snatched away first, for the church is saved from the day of the wrath of God Almighty. And that's a scriptural quote. Ten, no rapture at all. One event, the resurrection of the just, will occur when the Lord returns to the earth for both the church, which is his body, and for Israel, both at the same time. There is one general resurrection and one general judgment, both at the great white throne. Is this view valid? No. At the rapture, both the dead and the living believers are gathered together unto the Lord at the same time. When Christ returns to the earth of Israel, the living are judged and the righteous saved, but the righteous dead are not raised for another 75 days. The scriptural conclusion is that premillennialism and the pre-tribulation rapture are accurate according to God's written word. The scriptures will not fit together under any other scenario. It's time for those who teach about the end times to humble themselves under the truth of God's word. Now, in the supplement of this book, I'm not going to read it tonight. You can read, When Did the Body of Christ Begin? Born Again versus a New Creation, and the Bride in the Body of Christ to solidify these truths even more. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the rapture of the saints. When we compare what we did last week, uh, with what's revealed in the Pauline epistles, they don't fit. They just don't fit. There's no way you can make the resurrection of the just the same as the rapture, the same event as the rapture without having tons of contradiction in God's word. And whenever you have a contradiction in God's word, that means you have not rightly divided it. I means something's wrong somewhere. The word has to agree to be the truth. So I wanted to present this on the rapture because I've been seeing a lot online lately 
that's refuting it, that's saying it's false. And a lot of people are falling into the trap because they don't know the scriptures. They're not putting it together. So, let's go over to comments here. Hi, Ed. J.K. Bell, great to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. Praise God. I've been going back and forth with a brother whose theology has led him from extreme hellfire rapture to believing in post-millennialism. He gets really passionate, but hate to tell him he's wrong. Just send him the video. Let me tell him. <laughs> Let me tell him in love. You know, you just can't do it. You can't make a post-millennialism rapture. It's impossible. We're not going through the wrath of God. Okay, Jeff, I'll look at that change. You're right. I believe Trump is the final beast of Antichrist. God showed me in 2020 and has confirmed as of recently. Little Hornet Daniel is a, uh, a what? I lost that note somewhere. Oh, uh, you know, JK, I'm going to be doing a, a, a session on, I mean, a whole course on Revelation that we're going to get to. So I'll address those things when we get there. What else do we have here in these chats? Under grace, Jesus taught mercy all through his earthly ministry, even while on the cross. He asked his father to forgive them for they knew not and all his perils teach mercy. Yeah. Yeah, mercy and grace. But he was still under law. He fulfilled it for us, thank God. Yep, we get a glorious body. And you say, not long ago, I didn't believe in the rapture, so I believe the Darby Catholic girl Jesuit theory. I'm not sure what you're talking about there because they're they're blaming uh, the rapture on them. <laughs> but as we've seen, it's in the word of God. Um, so, yeah. Schofield was right. Darby was right. There is a rapture. A trump. I had, that's funny. I like that. that the, the musical instrument known as a trump. <laughs> uh, thank you, Brother Richard. I still struggle with the understanding of the rapture situation. I've changed my views to believe that the Great Tribulation is three and a half years, 12 to two days, 42 months, not seven years. Well, there's two three and a half year periods in there. J.K. Bell, but let's get to the Revelation uh, thing first. Last week's session, I covered the, the um, Daniel's prophecy. You might want to review that, too. Okay. Two systems on Revelation, the harlot and the beast. The beast rides the harlot. That's right. Yep. Um. I'm not making a, any comments on who's who, who who these are now. Okay, we're going to wait till the course for that. First three and a half years is a fake peace. Second three and a half years is a tribulation. Let's trump it. Yeah, do due diligence and study it out. Yes, download the book. It'll help. At least it has the verses there. You can interpret them as you want. St. Louis, you're welcome. Uh, Wesley, Carey, who am I? The little book written in Revelation. The angels of Jesus even speak my words to you. <laughs> I'm not sure where you're coming from there, Wesley. Judy, great to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. God bless you. Hope everything's all right. Norman LaBelle. Hi, Richard. 
Hi, Norman. <laughs> Reading your comment. Uh, yeah. 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 No, the, the actual timing uh, from Daniel on Jesus, J.K. Bell, is when he announced himself as king on the donkey, when he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. That's what it's time to. That's when the prince arrives. <laughs> So that that's that's at the end of his three and a half his three year ministry. It wasn't even three and a half. That um, that's just trading that out. All right, you guys, you got to go. We've been on a long time, and people aren't going to listen this long because concentration levels have shrunk. Anyway, thank you for joining me. I hope you got something out of this. If you need something uh, to drill down on the rapture with somebody, refer them to this this channel. You're welcome, everybody. God bless you. And see you next time. I'll be on Saturday morning. I'm not sure what we're doing yet. I might just start talking and taking questions. I'm not sure yet, but uh, I'm ready to go, and I'm sure you are too. So God bless you. Thank you for coming. See you next time.